بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Jazakumullahu khayran for your attendance We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us all and to forgive our sins and our shortcomings Brothers and sisters in Islam a few months ago there was a very famous powerful statement that was made from the blessed land a statement that was very powerful that it became very viral and it is up until this day trending hundreds and millions of views non-muslims non-arabs arabs and muslims everyone saw it and everyone made an effort to memorize it and to understand the story behind it and it was a phrase made up of two words and that was ruhu ar-ruh which is translated to the soul of the soul we want to reflect over these two words and understand what is the reality of ruhu ar-ruh what is the reality of the soul of the soul of course you and i know that this was a man may allah azza wa jal bestow patience upon him and may allah azza wa jal bestow his mercy upon those who he lost a man that lost two d ones to him and he is a story or one of millions that suffer loss in life is a story ruh al ruh is a story of a man that lost something incredibly dear to him and then he exercised patience and he became resilient in the face of this adversity and calamity that Allah azza wa jalla decreed for him and he became an inspiration and a motivation for the world what exactly was the inspiration to the world what exactly made him an inspiration and what made him behave the way he did when he was holding the lifeless body of his granddaughter you see ruh al ruh they meant by this that his daughter is his soul and her daughter is the soul of the soul that is what was meant by it so we need to investigate and reflect over this matter this is a story and he is one of millions around the world that suffer loss and we need to understand how do we get to this type of patience and resilience in our life whenever allah azza wa jalla tests us because you see one of the greatest calamities that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for mankind is loss we will all suffer loss in one way or another Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran he said wa la nablawnakum bi shay'in min al-khawf wa al-ju'i wa naqs naqs min al-amwal wa al-anfus wa al-thamarat Surah Al-Baqarah Allah Azza wa Jalla he promised he promised a reality for each and every single one of us he said we will surely test you he said bi naqsin with loss bi naqsin min al-amwal wa al-anfus wa al-thamarat loss of wealth loss of health loss of loved ones loss of business and so human beings experience loss loss of loved ones we said as they die friends relatives parents children loss of wealth financial setbacks you lose some money you lose in an investment a business you opened it loses people experience uh, loss of independence when you get or reach old age someone with a disability he lost his independence now he needs to rely on others loss of property 
after traumatic events, for example, an accident or a bushfire, whatever it is, a person loses his car, his house, materialistic matter, this is also loss. Loss of social status, you might have done something, right? Um, and as a result, there's a public attack on you. You lose your social status. Loss of dignity, loss of honor. You lose respect of people. There's so many types of losses that people go through. Loss of health, loss of old, a young age, the youthful age that you lived in, you lost it now as you grow older and coming towards your grief. Loss. This is the biggest calamity that Allah Azza wa Jal promised mankind. Each and every single one of us will go through it. The righteous and the most pious, starting from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, going all the way down until we reach the rebellious and the most transgressive among us. Everyone will experience loss. And so the believer now needs to understand that there is a manner and an attitude that Allah Azza wa Jal wants from you in terms of how do you behave at a moment of loss. We look at our brother over there and we say, Allahu Akbar, what is this type of patience? What is this incredible resilience and steadfastness that you had? How can I have some of that when I experience a loss in life? Brothers and sisters in Islam, the reality is, Ruh al-Ruh is actually the Qur'an. That's what it is. And I'll explain to you how. Allah Azza wa Jal created us two parts. A body and a soul. This body of ours was created from organic matter, from the earth. And all the needs of this body come from where the body came from. That is earth. So we eat from what the earth provides. We eat from where the drink is, which is on earth. Sunlight, we need it for the skin to, to replenish and so on. And that's here with us on earth. So all the needs of the body come from where the body came from. The other part that we're made of is a soul. We have a soul inside of us. And this soul of ours also needs to feed on something. It needs to eat in order for it to survive and to remain alive. If this body of yours, you deprived it of food and drink, give yourself a week, maximum, you will decompose and you will die. This soul as well, if it's not feeding on something, it will die. And the soul came from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah said, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي They ask you concerning the soul, tell them. That the soul is from the commandment of my Lord. It came from Allah Azza wa Jal. When Allah Azza wa Jal gave life to Adam alayhi salam, He said to the angels, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Once I blow the soul, the created soul of mine into Adam, then make sujood for him. The idea is we have a soul in us that came from Allah Azza wa Jal directly. We don't have a lot of information about it. But what we know is that this soul also needs food. And the food of the soul is where the soul came from. The soul came from Allah. Well, Quran is also described in the Quran as a ruh. You know that? One of the descriptions, one of the names of the Quran is a ruh. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا We have revealed a ruh from our commandment. A ruh meaning the revelation. The ulama said that the Quran is called a ruh because it gives life to the ruh that's in us. Therefore making it ruh a ruh. Making it the soul of the soul. Allah Azza wa Jalla in Surah An-Nahl, He said, يُنَزِّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ بِالرُّوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ Allah Azza wa Jalla sends down the angels with the ruh, meaning with the revelation. وَجِبْرِيلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ One of his names is الروح. تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا الروح here is Jibreel. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينُ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينُ this is Jibreel alayhi salam. He was called Ar-Ruh because he comes down with Ar-Ruh. 
He comes down with the Quran. Therefore, brothers and sisters in Islam, the reality of Ruhu, Ruh, is the Quran. Being a soul for your soul. This soul of the human being, if you cut it off from the Quran, it dies. It dies. It will be in chaos and in all sorts of mess, especially in times of calamity. The most important pillar in life to keep you strong and steadfast and resilient when facing an adversity or facing a calamity of loss is the Quran. We reflect over the story of our brother. There is absolutely no doubt that it is the Quran by the permission of Allah that made him steadfast and resilient in the face of whatever he faced of losing two of his dear ones. Because when you hear his words, what are they? Alhamdulillah, oh, that's from the Quran. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil, that's from the Quran. Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi raji'un, that's from the Quran as well. So the brother understands something deep that these words are a shifa, they are a healing for a person who is facing a calamity. Allahu Akbar. And so I tell you, brothers and sisters, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he lived in Mecca, he lost two loved ones of his as well. Just like our brother. He lost two dear ones. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca also loses two dear ones of his. Khadija radiallahu anha, who is the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mother of all his children except Ibrahim radiallahu anhu. And he also lost Abu Talib, his uncle. His uncle was strong support and protection for him. To the point where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, I never faced I never faced extreme violence and abuse from Quraysh except from the day when Abu Talib died because he was protecting him all along. Once he died, all the attacks, ferocious attacks would start coming onto the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two of his loved ones died on two different days in a seerah. That year is called Amul Huzn. The year of sorrow and sadness. They just died on two different days. But the entire year was called Amul Huzn. You can understand how immense the pain was in the heart of the Messenger. This is not easy. This is something that Allah has decreed for mankind, and there is immense pain and suffering in it. But without the Quran, you will. Drown in your pain and suffering. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lost the two dear ones, Allah azza wa jal revealed unto the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that moment, Surah Yusuf. Surah Yusuf is about a father, a prophet, Ya'qub, who also loses two beloved ones to him. His son Yusuf alayhi salam and his other son that is known among the Mufassirun as Bin Yamin. And that Surah Yusuf gave incredible inspiration and motivation and guidance to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during his loss. Allahu Akbar. So the Quran, the Quran which is a ruh revived his ruh in a moment of calamity and loss. And the stories of the Qur'an are the backbone of the human being. You will never be able to go through your calamity and behave in a manner that Allah Azza wa Jal loves to see from you without the Qur'an. Wallahi, take it from me from now. You will never be able to achieve what Allah wants to see from you during a loss without the Qur'an and the stories of the Qur'an. Very simple, memorize it. This is a principle in life. Allah Azza wa Jal reveals the stories of the Qur'an so that we can share our pain with a real life example. 
So when I go through a loss, and I read the story of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I read the story of Yaqub alayhi salam, I know that I'm not unique in my loss. I share my suffering with someone else that was dear to Allah azza wa jalla and tested in the same manner. There is absolutely no one among us here that suffers a unique loss that has never been experienced by any of Allah's prophets. And I'm, I'm giving you ease of research. Do what you like and go see this for yourself in the Quran and tell me how true it is. Or tell me if I'm wrong as well. Give me advice. No one is unique in his calamity. Every calamity you speak about and every loss you talk about, it's somewhere there in the Quran. Whatever it is. Losing your father as a role model, an abusive father, there it is between Ibrahim and his father. What else? Think of whatever you like. Being slandered and your honor being stripped and your dignity taken away, that's Maryam alayhi salam. Maryam radiallahu anha, when they accused her of filth and evil. Plenty. Every story in the Quran will mention to you something about a calamity. And the point of the story in the Quran is what? What's the point of a story in the Quran? Allah Azza wa Jalla says to us, وَكُلَّ النَّقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ and in Surah Yusuf at the end, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ." Allah Azza wa Jalla says in Surah Yusuf, that very same Surah that He reveals unto the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم when He has lost two dear ones, He says, "Team, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ." Indeed, in their stories, there is a عبرة لأولي الألباب. عبرة is loosely translated as valuable lessons. There are lessons, there are wisdoms الألباب, for people of sane minds, which are the believers. But you know, the word ibra is more interesting than just translating it and saying lessons. Actually, the word ibra comes from the word abara. Abara means to travel from one side of the river to the other side of the river. That's what abara is. The, and the boat that takes you from one side to the other side, it's called Al-Abira. Al-Abira, and it goes from one side to the other. That's what Ibra is. The idea is, when the stories of the Qur'an are told to us by Allah that they are a Ibra, meaning, when you, before you read the story, you're on this side of the river. You're sad, you're depressed, you're misguided, you're confused, you're lost. After you read a story from the Qur'an, it should take you from this side of the river, from the side of hopelessness to the side of hopefulness, from the side of despair to the side of certainty in the mercy and forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And every story in the Qur'an does that. So when you read, when you suffer a calamity of any sort of loss, and you read a story in the Qur'an, if you still haven't moved from this side of despair and hopeful, hopelessness to the other side where there is hopefulness, you're not reading the story right. Go and read it again. Because there is ibrah. Not only that, ibrah also, the T's, you know the T's, they're called abarat. In Arabic, they're also sakabat al-abarat. And they call that because when the T dropped, when it falls from the eye, it travels from this part onto the cheek. There's like a distance, it travels. So the idea is that the story of the Quran moves you emotionally as well. It, it's that powerful that it moves you to tears if you're reading and understanding what you're reading. And so, Allahu Akbar, brothers and sisters in Islam, Al Quran is going to be the soul of your soul when you are facing a calamity of any type of loss. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam imagine, there's the story of Yaqub and him suffering loss and the worst type of loss. His two children are missing. Wallahi, a missing child is a lot worse than two dead children. Two dead children, at least, it's very sad, it's difficult. You bury them. Alhamdulillah, there's closure to the matter. 
you know where they are, they are buried, alhamdulillah, in the Allah, with Ibrahim, bi Allah. We're all good. You can find inspiration. But two missing children? This is a nightmare for parents. A nightmare for the community. Every single day you wake up with a new nightmare. You wake up with a new thought. You wake up with refreshed wounds and pains and sufferings. What happened to my son today? What happened to my daughter? Did they eat? Did they drink? Did they sleep? Who's taking, who's taking them? Are they being punished? Are they not? Are they happy? Are they crying the whole time? And immense suffering. Allahu Akbar. And that's the case of Yaqub alayhi salam. Two sons are missing. At the very beginning, he loses the trust of his children. That's a calamity. He loses their trust. They say, Father, give us Yusuf. We're just going to play with him and we'll send him back. So they come back and they make up a story. That the fox, whatever it is, the wolf came and ate him and he's gone. Yaqub knows that this is lies. He can see the shirt is not even ripped. How is it full of blood? This is blood of, of, of a sheep or something. So, in this moment of calamity, what does he say? What he says is what you and I are supposed to say as well. He says to them, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تصفون. He says, I'm going to practice beautiful patience. Allahu Akbar. What is beautiful patience? When we know something called patience. But this is strange. Beautiful patience? What's beautiful patience? Is that the same as patience or this is another degree? Of course, it's a higher degree than plain patience. The difference between sabrun jamil and sabr alone is that sabr, patience is you talking that which Allah is pleased with, like saying alhamdulillah, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un and so on. And sabr is not to say what displeases Allah Azza wa Jal. So you refrain from saying what displeases Allah Azza wa Jal. And you complain to mankind. So you come to mankind and you say to them, Allah, Allah tested me with one, two, three, and I'm going through one, two, three. Hada sabr. No problems. You can complain. You can complain of your suffering to others. As sabrul jameel, beautiful patience, is to make a complaint about your suffering only to Allah Azza wa Jal and no one else. Sabrun Jameel. You're complaining to Allah and you're not complaining about Allah. You're not complaining and saying, why did Allah decree this and that? Why did he test me in this way and this? No, 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 no. And then you lose your patience. That's called displeased with Allah. Sabrul Jameel. He said to them, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ And Allah will help me over that which you are saying of words of lies and fabrications. They lied. So Allah is going to help me against your lies and your fabrications. Here Allah Azza wa is guiding us. How you're supposed to behave when you lose trust in others. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ Can you imagine the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reading this and he's relating to himself? Now he's going to be losing the respect of all his people. All his people. When Abu Talib died and Khadija died, his protection died. He's going to be, now Quraysh are going to be getting... Uh, the intestines of the camel and so on and throwing it on him. They're going to slander. They're going to abuse him. They're going to mock him. They're going to curse him. They're going to reject him. They're going to try to prison him, kill him, exile him. Everything you can think of. And his state, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ Allahu Akbar. You know these words were even repeated by Aisha radiallahu anha when she suffered her loss of trust as well. You know that? In Hadithat al-Ifq, there is an event that happened in the seerah known as Hadithat al-Ifq. 
This is when Aisha radiallahu anha was accused of a zina billah by al munafiqun They took advantage of this matter. The story is very long, but people had lost, she lost trust of people. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not know what to do. He didn't know. There was no wahi that had come down. Eventually, she moves out from the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and goes to her own parents' house, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and her mother. And she's so sick. And she says, I cried, I cried until the tears had ran out. She had no more tears. She goes, I did not eat. All she did was would go to the bathroom if she was in need of that to relieve herself and come back and that's it. No communication with anyone. No eating, no drinking, suffering, pain. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not talking to her. Abu Bakr doesn't know what to say. Her mother doesn't know what to say. Eventually a month goes by. That's her condition. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to visit her for the first time. And he makes a shahada. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah ya Aisha. I need to say to, to you something. In kunti al mamti bi dhambin fastaghfirillah. That if you had done something haram, then seek Allah's forgiveness. How painful is this? One of the most heaviest types of oppression is to be accused of something you never did and you cannot prove that you're innocent. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of course he hasn't accused her, but he just doesn't know what to do. He's saying if you've done something, seek Allah's forgiveness. And if you haven't done anything, then Allah will reveal your innocence. Then she looks at her father and she says, Abu Bakr, say something. He says, Wallahi, I don't know what to say. Mother, say something. Wallahi, I don't know what to say. And then she looked at them all. Imagine this. And she said, I was a young girl. I did, know, I did not know a lot of Quran. I didn't know a lot of Quran. She said to them, I will say and I will take the father of Yusuf as my example. And I will say, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ Allahu Akbar. It's a source of strength. She became resilient in the face of that tremendous calamity and adversity. Allahu Akbar. Quran. هذا روح الروح. Look at the story now of Yaqub going back. 80 years of suffering. He lost two of his children for 80 years. You know what? We don't know what 80 years is. We haven't even lived till 80 years. You got no clue. Not only that, every single day is a refreshed wound. It's not healing. And his suffering and his sadness reaches the point where he loses his sight. وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ Allah says, His eye became white from grief and sadness. You know white? And you know the blackness in the eye? All became white. This is the worst type of blindness. فَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ And in addition to this, all of him is sad. 80 years of pain and suffering. 80 years. Al-Hasan. When he made a commentary on Yaqub alayhi salam, he said, on, during that time, there was no one more beloved to Allah on earth than Yaqub alayhi salam. The most beloved to Allah and the most extremely tested because that's the equation. The more beloved, the more test. That's the equation. After 80 years, he gathers his children, what remains of them, 10 of them. He says to them, Ya bani yadhabu fatahassasu mi Yusuf. He says, my sons, go and search for Yusuf. Wala tayasu min rawhillah. Do not despair in the mercy of Allah. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Innahu la yayasu min rawhillah illa al-qawmu al-kafirun. No one gives up hope in the mercy of Allah except the disbelieving rebellious nation. Allahu Akbar. 
No, no, let me tell you this in a manner where it will actually wake you up. Ya'qub alayhi salam is not saying to his children, don't lose hope in Allah's mercy when things are all good and he's sitting, kicking back and relaxing. He says to them this word. He says to them, don't lose hope in Allah after 80 years of suffering, 80 years of loss. His eye has become blind and he is full of sadness. Yet these are his words and that's his good thought in Allah Azza wa Jal after 80 years. لا تيأسوا من روح الله He says to them, this is the achievement in calamity. These are the words that guide you in your moment of sadness to go from this side of the river to the other side of hopefulness. That you as a believer should always know and understand that no one despairs from the mercy of Allah except the disbelieving people. No matter how intense the calamity was. And there's your examples. Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam. See how the Quran is ruh al ruh. He said this word of hope and good thinking in Allah. Moments later, he smells the shirt of his son. And moments after that, Yaqub is, Yusuf alayhi salam is in between his hand, he's hugging him. I tell you something. When you read the story of Yusuf, and finally get to the end and learn about this reunion that Allah Azza wa Jal decrees for them. Probably most of us think that that's a happy ending and this is where the achievement of the story is finally he met him. Wallahi, this is wrong. This is not the achievement of the story. You see, Allah Azza wa Jal could have reunited between Yaqub and his son Yusuf after a week of losing him. Could have done that after a year. Aslan Allah Azza wa is going to reunite between them in the paradise anyway. Reunion is going to happen. That's not the issue. The biggest achievement in the story is the steadfastness and the firmness of Yaqub alayhi salam in the middle of his calamity. That is the achievement. That's the moral. That's the ibrah in the story. So can you imagine the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reading this? And reflecting over his own loss of Khadija radiallahu anha and Abu Talib. And can you see how these words will be the biggest source of his inspiration? That he will also say, لا تيأسوا من روح الله. And you reflect over our brother over there. And there is absolutely no doubt that this would comfort anyone that loses dear ones to him. لا تيأسوا من روح الله was a word said by a prophet that lost two dear ones of his. And the worst type of loss. Look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam and how much he lost and how much suffering and calamity he went through. He lost time with his father. He lost that, that child that a child is supposed to live. He was separated from his parents. He was thrown in a well alone. Then he was taken by people on a caravan. Then he was sold. He lost his freedom. Then he was put in the palace of Al-Aziz. Then he was exposed to a massive fitna. He was forced to display the beauty that Allah gave him. Yusuf salam was given half the beauty of mankind. He was forced to display his beauty in front of a bunch of girls. What a fitna is this? And they were so mesmerized and taken by what they saw that they began to cut their own fingers. Imagine this type of fitna. Well, it's not easy. And he knows it wasn't easy. He got to a point where he made a dua. Listen to what he said. He said, Rabbi sijnu ahabbu ilay mimma yad'unani ilay he said, Lord, prison, prison, which is a loss of freedom, which is a difficult calamity, this prison, this calamity is more beloved to me than what they are calling me to. Of fitna and fasad and zina wal haram. Wa illa tasrif anni kaydahun. If you don't move away their evil planning from me, 
I will eventually asbu ilayhin. I will, I'm a human. I'm going to incline to them. وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ And as a result, I'll be from among the ignorant, foolish people. Allahu Akbar. A prophet suffered so much of a loss that he'd prefer a calamity of losing freedom over enjoying the temptations of this world, the life. What a huge sacrifice to make in your relationship with Allah. When you recognize and you realize that if a calamity is going to save my iman, I'd rather that than an entire dunya that will take my iman away from me. Allahu Akbar. Have you made this type of sacrifice in your life? Do you have a moment between you and Allah Azza wa Jal where you preferred a calamity over a worldly life that would have taken your iman away? Show the believer how his attitude is supposed to be with Allah. Prove yourself. Prove yourself that your relationship with Allah is more dear to you than this worldly life and everything in it. See the type of sufferings and calamity he faced. Then after this, he's put in prison. His life goes from calamity to calamity. Sold as a slave. Ends up in this nasty event with these women. Then he's entered, put in prison for bilba'a sinin, seven to nine years. Just seven to nine. We talk he's seven to nine years like it's nothing. Go sit nine years in prison day by day and you'll feel exactly what this is all about. And also, put consideration, his dad's lost him and he's gone through all this calamity already thrown in a well. His brothers didn't want him. They wanted to kill him and he feels very lonely. A person at that point is suicidal. Khalas, and I can't do life anymore. I've been rejected. My own brothers hate me. They wanted to kill me. I'm sold as a slave. I'm gone. I don't know where my mom, my dad is. Yet he's still holding on. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we keep moving forward in his story. And we realize eventually Allah starts to relieve, give him relief. Allah has decreed your relief. Don't rush it. That's when finally the king sees a dream. See how Allah decrees things? A dream a king saw was the start of relief for Yusuf alayhi salam. We're learning that when you're in an intense calamity, sit down and relax. Sit down and relax and maintain and observe your faith. Relief is on its way, but you don't know how. A dream? A king sees a dream? What kind of dream? Seven fat cows being consumed by seven skinny cows? Uh, what, uh, what, what, what is this? And then he wants an interpretation for it. He doesn't even, he doesn't dismiss it. He wakes up disturbed. They, I, I want to, I need someone to explain this to me. Eventually they get to Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam explains it, put the plan. He gives them like a kind of a risk management, what we're supposed to do for the next seven years and the next seven years. And then the one year that comes and drought and there's no water, no rain. And you got no clue how to deal with your agricultural matters. If you don't get me onto being an agricultural minister, all of you are going to starve to death. The plan is this, oh khalas, they brought him out of prison and they made him an agricultural minister. Relief starts to come slowly, slowly. Anyone who upholds a taqwa, Allah will make a way for him. Allah will provide for him from unexpected ways. Look at this story, you even read it. That dream is an unexpected way. If you have never read the story of Yusuf and you're for the first time reading it in your life, you'd say, oh, subhanallah, what is all this? A dream got him out of prison? No one can imagine this. That's an example of that ayah. Eventually, until he is reunited with his father and with his brothers and with his family. At the end of all of that, and at the end of the surah, after all these calamities, you know what he says? You know what Yusuf alayhi salam says? He says, وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي 
my Lord has always been kind and merciful and compassionate towards me. That's his what? That's his attitude with Allah. That's his manners with Allah. That's his good thinking of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allahu Akbar. وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي After 80 years, from calamity to calamity to another calamity to where he was forced to make a decision and love a calamity more than this worldly life. And at the end, you're seeing your Lord has always been kind to you. Just, wasn't Allah unkind to you just one day or two days? وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي all along. Oh, Akbar. It is the soul of the soul. It heals that wound. It gives you that guidance and that steadfastness in the time of calamity to know that you're not alone and unique in your calamity. You share it with the best of people. Oh, Akbar. And then he keeps on going to say, Inna Rabbi latifun lima yasha. My Lord is Latif. Latif, yani he is gentle and compassionate to whoever he wants. Allahu Akbar. These are powerful words. You know, Yusuf alayhi salam, at the end of his life, what does he want? It's just one thing he wants from Allah. One thing only. And he begs Allah for it. He says, Tawafani muslima wa alhiqni bis salihin. Cause me to die upon Islam and admit me with the righteous. Let me get into the paradise with the prophets and the messengers and the pious and the noble ones. Yes, this is it. But tawaffani muslima, that's all I want. Years of suffering, no worries. Qad ahsanabi, you have always been good to me. I just want one thing. Guarantee my death upon Islam. Enta, yani. See this, Tawafani Musliman, he proved in his life that he actually wants it. He went through all these calamities without a single negative thought about Allah Azza wa Jal. He went through all of these sufferings, not a single complaint, accepted at all. Tawafani Muslima, he even preferred a calamity to save his Iman. He proved himself that he really wants Islam. He said, I'd rather sit in prison nine years and lose my freedom than to be out there losing my iman. So, Rabb tawaffani muslima. Accept that bit of sacrifice. Enter in your life. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? Salat al-Fajr will come to the masjid and it's a difficulty upon people. Where's the sacrifice you're showing Allah that you really want tawaffani muslima. Tawaffani musliman, you need to pay a price for a price. What's the price that you're paying? What's this immense sacrifice you're doing for the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal and for yourself to prove that inter, you're, you're really genuinely upholding la ilaha illallah in your life? Subhanallah. Tawaffani muslima wa alhiqni bis salihin. Allahu Akbar. Imagine the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reading the story of Yusuf. And he's being healed by this story. That's what the Quran is. Ruh, we told you it's a soul of the soul and it's shifa as well as Allah said. See this, this heart of yours? When you're in a calamity, the heart is disturbed. Allah created the heart. It's owned by Allah. Allah owns your heart. No one's going to repair it for you. No one's going to heal it for you other than Allah Azza wa Jal. No one, no one. Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't allow anyone. No one. No one's allowed to touch it. No one's allowed to come near it. You think going from one therapist to another to another and to a third and to a fourth and international and read books of psychology and whatever is going to heal you up? That's a worldly matter. You can use that if you like. There's no problem. But don't you dare ever think that this heart will be healed with that stuff separate from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah owns the heart and He's the one who gives it shifa. And He gives it shifa through the Quran, through His word. Ya ayyuhal nasu qad ja'atkum mawaidatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur. 
This is Allah's words. We're not making this up tonight. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, We revealed this Quran, Mawaidah, as an advice, admonishment to mankind. And within this Quran, there is shifa, there is a healing for what is in the chest, in the heart. Al Quran heals in times of calamity. Every loss you suffer, there is someone in the Quran that guides you out of it. Look at Ayyub alayhi salam. Ayyub alayhi salam lost his health, his wealth, his businesses. All the community ran away. He was alone in his one more house left with his wife. She'd pick him up when he goes to the bathroom and puts him back. Everyone ran away. They got scared from a disease. He had 18 years. Suffered the worst type of loss. People lost respect for him. Lost his wealth, his health, his children all died, his businesses. And all along, he makes a dua. Shift this dua. He says, Asani al-dur. Shuf his manners, his attitude. This is where you want to get to in a moment of calamity. My Lord, evil has touched me. Touch. Masani al-dur. Wa anta arhamur rahimeen. And you're the most merciful. Allahu Akbar. When things are easy, it's very easy for you and I to say Allah is the most merciful. But try to say it after 18 years of suffering and loss. If you can say it, then you've achieved something in life. That's the achievement. That's good thought in Allah. Hey, that's the last thing you'd be thinking about Allah, that He's the most merciful. When you're in a situation like this. But the prophets are examples for you and I. If you have suffered such a loss, like Prophet Ayyub, he's your inspiration, he's your ibrah. This story is enough to take you from this side of the river to the side of hopefulness. Enough. More than enough. How? But how does the story of the Qur'an heal? How? How? I don't know. Don't ask the question. I don't know. Allah gives us shifa. You see, I'll tell you something. Allah did not refer to the Qur'an as dawa. Who knows what dawa is? Medicine. Dawa is medicine. But what's shifa? Shifa is what? Healing, cure. What's the difference between dawa and shifa? A dawa, medicine, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But shifa, 100% on point. It's shifa actually, it's healing. See, if you ask me how does dawa work, I can explain to you. I can say, well, the medicine... This type of medicine has this type of active ingredient. So then when you take the pill or you take it orally, this liquid, it enters your body. It goes into the bloodstream. This active ingredient targets the pain and as a result, relief as well. I can explain dawa. But how do you explain healing? When a person wakes up overnight, alhamdulillah, I'm better. How do you explain that? You cannot explain it. Well, Quran... When you read the ayat that are a shifa, they're not medicine. They are not dawa. The ayat are not, yani, huh, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. It is shifa, it works all the time. You read an ayah that relates to your calamity, it takes you from this side of the river to the other side, bi by Allah's permission. So you look now again at the brother that had lost two of his dear ones. You say, how the hell? Were you? <laughs> like not, no tears, no crying later on, no problems, you can cry, you can be sad, look, Yaqub alayhi salam was crying, was sad, there's no issue but do not lose hope in Allah, that's where the problem is and that's the brother's story where did he get where did he get the shifa from all overnight and Allah healed his heart instantly that's what we want we want some of that and even more when we face our calamities of loss, Allahu Akbar Look at Yunus alayhi salam. He ends up in the belly of a whale that's losing freedom. That's like a prison. That's, that's losing a lot of things. He lost health in that as well. He lost the respect of his people. Remember, he, he took off on 100,000 people that didn't respect him and listened to his message and he walked away. In that, again, good thought in Allah. Look what he says. La ilaha illa ant. There is no Lord 
worthy of worship except you. He did not say, La ilaha illallah. He said, La ilaha illa ant. You know the word ant? It's a pronoun. When do you use it? When you're referring to something close to you. So if I'm talking to his brother here, I'll say, Anta. I'll say, Ant, come here. So when he says, La ilaha illa ant, he realizes the closeness of Allah Azza wa to him. How far is he? He's in the depth of an ocean. He's in the darkness of the darkest part of the ocean. The darkness of the night, the darkness of the belly of the whale. If he took his hand out, he couldn't even see it. From there, he can realize and feel Allah's closeness. La ilaha illa ant. Then he says, Subhanak. What's Subhanak? Subhanak means Allah, I free you from all imperfections and inappropriateness. In other words, Subhanak, that I ever think anything bad of you. The way to get rid of an evil thought in your mind about Allah in a moment of calamity is to say Subhanak. That gets rid of everything you're going to think evil about Allah Azza wa Jal. Subhanak. Now he takes it a step further. Watch this. Inni kuntu min al I am a wrongdoer. I did wrong. I'm in this calamity because of my own hands, because of my own decision that I made. I'm here because of me. Inni kuntu min al I'm not in this calamity of the belly of the world because of you. I'm not here because you oppressed me or wronged me. Allah. Subhanak. Allah doesn't oppress anyone. Allah doesn't wrong anyone. Allah is not unjust to anyone at all. Rather, Allah is full of wisdom and knowledge and justice. And everything He decrees is for knowledge and wisdom that He knows that no one else knows. Can you do that in a time of calamity? Who can sit there in a time of calamity and say, Allah, subhanak, it's me. I'm in this because of me. Inni kuntu min al This is an achievement, brothers and sisters. See how the Quran shapes your understanding of things. The worst thing that you can experience in a calamity is evil thoughts of Allah, azza wa jal, and acting by them. So an evil thought and acting by it is to say, why did Allah test me with this and with that? I don't want to pray anymore. Wallahi, there was a story a sheikh of ours tells us. It's written in Akhbar uh, Al-Hamqa wal Mughaffaleen. There is a book that Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah wrote. It's called Akhbar Al-Hamqa wal Mughaffaleen. The story of the foolish, heedless people. One of the stories he mentioned was a man that used to fast voluntarily. And he used to have camels as well. He fasted voluntarily. He had camels. And he lost seven of his camels. He said, Lord, I fasted voluntarily for your sake. And you deal with me in this manner and you take seven camels away from me. The days that I fasted, I'm going to minus them from Ramadan. So when Ramadan came, he fasted 23 days. And he did not fast the rest, the seven. By the law, show the foolishness. See here what it, he's thinking that Allah Azza wa done bad with him. So I'm going to get Allah back by missing seven days in Ramadan. Foolishness. But there is people like this. There is people like this in their relationship with Allah. How many times have you heard? Of a person, he left his salat, things were going bad in his life. How many stories have you heard? That a sister removed the hijab, things were going bad in her life. And what do we say to each other? Now leave him, leave him, you don't understand. He's going through a hard time. Shriana, he's the only one that's going through a hard time. No one else went through a hard time. And the reality is they didn't read the Quran. That's the reality. Give these people proper advice. Don't sit there and comfort them and tell them it's all right, you're going through this, doesn't matter, Allah doesn't want you to pray now, it's okay, take time off. You'd like to remove your hijab, it's all right, no worries, once things go better, come back. I share the advice you give to one another. Heather, this is from a shaitan. These people actually did not read the Quran, if anything, they are in need of these ayat in the Quran. They're in need of this type of medicine. 
The word subhanak eliminates and removes every evil thought you'll have of Allah. Inni kuntu min al-thalimeen. If anyone, it's you. You're in this issue because of you. How Allah works, we don't know. But we accept the calamity. Don't think that Allah is against you. Rather, this calamity is a purification for you. It's cleansing you. It's preparing you for the meeting with Allah. It's giving you a chance to exercise the beautiful patience Allah wants to see. How can you be patient if you're never tested in your patience? How can you practice this beautiful worship of patience if you're never tested? So Allah wants to elevate you. So He tests you to bring out this beautiful worship of patience and the beautiful worship of a dua and the beautiful worship of al-istighathah billah wal seeking His help wal All of these are worships of the heart. Like they'll never come out if you're not tested. So no, it's not the fact that Allah is against you. Otherwise, what are we going to say about prophets? Allah was against them all along. A'udhu billah, no one will say this. So don't understand wrong. The tests are there for a, for a reason and Allah already promised us this. It's not like coming out of the blue. He said, we're going to test you with loss. And, and the reason for why Allah told us this is so that we become more acceptable of it. We prepare for it. You know, like if I was a teacher, I came into the classroom and I said, brothers and sisters, you have an exam today. You're all shocked. What do you mean? You didn't tell us. We're not prepared. So imagine I'm a teacher and I said to you, brothers, in a month's time, you have an exam. So a month's time, come, I give you the exam. Is anyone shocked? No. But Allah told us in the Quran, we will test you with loss. And when the loss comes, didn't Allah already tell you? What's wrong? There's one of two things. Either Allah did not tell you or you're not reading the Quran and reading what Allah has promised you. One of two. So the believer is prepared. Shuf al-Quran. It shapes the mind. It shapes the attitude. It puts you on that path that you're supposed to be with Allah. Look at the people of the cave. When they ran away from their society and they wanted, they want, they are wanted to be stoned to death. They lose all their life. Because they're going to end up now in this cave for 300 years. Khalas, that was their death. Because as soon as they came out and they went back in, they all died. When they entered a cave, imagine you're a fugitive of the law. You're wanted. And these were children of princes and kings. Young boys. They didn't even get to say goodbye to their mothers, to their friends, nothing. They picked themselves up and ran to a cave. They ended up in the cave and they looked at one another. Imagine, six, seven boys stuck in a cave. What are you going to talk to one another? Most likely people will say, what are we going to do today? When are we going to come out? What are we going to eat? Where are we going to sleep? Spiders, scorpions coming out from the corners of this dark cave. Ah, they did not speak all of this. You know what they said? Once they entered the cave, Allah is going to spread His mercy upon us. And Allah is going to take this difficult case of ours and mold it, make it flexible. It's going to be easy. Mirfaqa. Mirfaqa is a pillow. Look at, the, look at the good thought they are having in Allah in the midst of a calamity. That's your thought in Allah. That's exactly what Allah dealt with them. And He put them to sleep for the next 300 years and saved them from the calamity and from all this chaos. 300 years. They are nourished, sustained. Allah's looking after them. Angels come, flip them. So that they don't develop bed sores. They need sunlight. The sun's coming in. Well, sunlight comes. It gets to the mouth of the cave, but the morning sunlight can burn the skin over 300 years. So the rays bend. 300 years every single day a miracle is happening for people that have good thought in Allah. These are not prophets. These are people that came after Isa before Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hala, hala, recently. Yani. And in the afternoon when it's setting, taqridhum that al shimal it loans them some sunlight as it sets because the sun setting, the rays are a lot lighter. They didn't damage the skin. And the eyes... If it's closed for a long time, it'll dry out. 
So Allah keeps their eyes open. You assume them sleeping, but they actually you assume them awake, but they're actually sleeping because their eyes were open. And the dog is at the mouth of the cave to protect them from anyone coming in. Too much relief from Allah Azza wa Jal for people that have good thought in him during a moment of calamity. That's what the Quran is teaching you. That's what the Quran is teaching you and I. This is how it is a shifa and a healing. This is how the Quran is ruhu al ruh. Sometimes there are people that lose the plot and they cry intensely because of their calamity. And you look at him and you say, brother, you should be crying more that you don't have an ayah that could have guided you out of this situation of yours. Cry because you don't have ayat and stories from the Quran that would have been a shifa for you in this moment of calamity. Well, the one who's far away from the Quran is far away from shifa. Khalas. is the equation. If the Quran is shifa and Quran is ruh, that means the closer you are to it, the more shifa you experience and there is life in your soul. No matter what situation you're in, whether good or bad. And the further away from your Quran, your further away you are from the Quran, you've distanced yourself from a shifa. You've distanced yourself from a ruh. You've said, Allah, I don't want to read what you have said to me. It's all right, I'll do this worldly life on my own. Khalas, you choose what you want. This is very simple. It's the equation. We need to understand the importance of a Quran in your life and how this is ruh al ruh and there is nothing else. Brothers and sisters in Islam, finally concluding. You know, Wallah, we can sit and discuss so many prophets and their stories of loss and how each and every single word they said in that moment of loss is the word that we are supposed to utter and shape our lives concerning that. You know, oh, there was one more point that was important to see. You know, these evil thoughts that come to a person in a moment of calamity. How can you fight these evil thoughts and evil actions? How? You, you can't punch them. You can't kick them. It's not like a physical enemy that has come that you can deal physically with him. The only way you can repel them is with good thoughts and that you get from the Quran. The only way you can repel it is with, with knowledge, Right? And the best type of knowledge is the knowledge of the Qur'an. So when you're saying, brother, I'm, I'm, I'm having these evil thoughts and bad thoughts and evil actions in a moment of calamity, what do I do? How do I save myself? How do I, how do I fight them? Well, the akhiyi, you cannot fight with your hands because obviously it's not a physical enemy. The only way you can fight them is get opposite to them, which is good thoughts. Where do you source that from? Well, the Qur'an, which is a shifa, which is a ruh. Fill that mind and heart of yours with Quran. Fill it with the word of Allah Azza wa Jal, so that when you experience the calamity of loss, they become a shifa, not medicine. They are shifa. You will definitely find standing ground to stand on and remain resilient in the face of this calamity until the day we meet Allah Azza wa Jal. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Ramadan is coming soon. Ramadan is all about the Quran. Wallahi, it's a mercy from Allah Azza wa Jal that He has, has extended our lives up until this point. So we ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend our lives to the point where we reach Ramadan and we witness all of Ramadan and we benefit from Ramadan and we do righteous actions that He is pleased with and He accepts it from us as well. You know, the achievement is not just to get to Ramadan. Well, everyone will get to Ramadan. Al munafiq wal kafiru. People will live through Ramadan. Yes, that's not the achievement. The achievement is what are you going to do within this month that's going to elevate you in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. So focus on the Quran in the month of Quran when the body has been deprived of food and drink. You give a ruh a chance to elevate and to rise. You give it a chance. That's why the fasting person in the Quran was called a sa'ihun. A sa'ih is a tourist. A fasting person is called a tourist in the Quran because our ruh is in tourism. It's discovering new relationship with Allah, new meanings that it has never seen in its life. That's only if you expose this ruh to Al-Quran. Yeah, no, you're not busy with eating and drinking and so on. All that has stopped. The, the ruh is going to connect with the Quran a lot more than if you are not fasting. And even a lot more when you're doing fasting in the month of Ramadan. 
take advantage of this moment. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enhance our relationship with His Word. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us all, to forgive our sins and our shortcomings, to bestow His mercy and forgiveness upon us all. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to admit us into the highest levels of the paradise and to save us from nari jahannam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina athab al-nar. Jazakum Allahu khayra. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.